Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob McMaster, and I'm currently a professor of geography, at least on Friday afternoons from time to time. And I have a few other odd and sultry jobs here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I wanted to welcome, first of all, the Borchert family, or some members of the Borchert family who came here for this lecture, Bill and Jane. And uh, we really appreciate you coming to hear the second annual Borchert lecture. Thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Borchert Lecture in Geographic Information Science. As many of you know, John Borchert, one of the intellectual fathers of our geography department, had a great love of maps and spatial information. And our internationally recognized map library was named the Borchert Map in 1989. John Borchert was one of the most influential geographers of the 20th century. Educated in geology at DePaul University in Chicago and having completed a PhD with a focus on climatology from the University of Eastern Minnesota, what we call Wisconsin, uh, he turned his keen mind to human settlement patterns and urban geography in the early years of his career. Uh, a Regents Professor and member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, John worked on the geography faculty for 40 years from 1949 to 1989 uh, with a career that intellectually spanned from biophysical geography to urban geography, but always with a focus on the, the map as the obligatory tool of our profession. It is John Borchardt's intellectual curiosity that most of us remember. He would constantly poke and prod us with questions and thoughts and was interested in all aspects of our discipline, geography, and many other areas of inquiry. In one of his very last creative activities, John developed a research project on the historical geography of the U.S. Railway Mail Service at the time of its peak importance to the national economy. That was around 1920. Last year, given his many contributions to our department and his great love of geography and maps, we decided to name this lecture series the John Borchardt Lecture Series in GIS. This fall, we're delighted that Michael Goodchild, another member of the National Academy of Sciences, agreed to be our Borchardt Lecture speaker. The first time Mike came to give a lecture here, in January 1996, we set the state record low of minus 60 degrees. It was minus 35 in the Twin Cities. When he came again in, the May, in May of 2000 for the Brown Day lecture, it was 65 degrees, which was a 100 degree difference between his first visit and second visit. Uh, so today we've arranged a temperature of about 35 degrees or so, which is uh, halfway in between the two. Uh, Unfortunately for Mike, he has to come back here again in January, late January for our Minnesota GIS Futures workshop, so he'll encounter the cold again. Uh, rather than ramble through the multitude of Mike's accomplishments, and there are many, I would like to focus on just a several or several of these. One is his degrees. Uh, he has a BA in physics from Cambridge University. That's not such a bad place. Uh, in 1965, uh, his PhD is in geography from McMaster University uh, in 1969. Uh, Mike is currently a professor of geography and former chair at the University. University of California, Santa Barbara, where he's helped to build one of the world's finest geography departments. From 1969 to 1988, he was on the faculty of the University of Western Ontario, where he rose through the ranks and served as chair of the department. Uh, among his many accomplishments, he served as director of National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis in its founding years, uh, later helped uh, to direct the Varenius and Alexandria projects at Santa Barbara. As director of the NSF-funded NCGIA and Varenius Projects, Mike has been at the helm of this country's re academic research programs in GIS. Uh, the NCGIA sponsored over 20 specialist meetings that generated the basic research agenda in the emerging discipline of GI systems, and more recently, GI science. It is interesting that the NCGIA is currently celebrating its 20th anniversary next month in December. 
Mike was the individual who first promoted the idea of a geographic information science that focused on the theoretical underpinnings of geographic information and created a research agenda that differentiated from the more technologically oriented systems part of GIS. Building on this concept of GIS science, Mike helped create the first ever national level organization to promote all aspects of the field, the University Consortium for GI Science in December of 1994. Mike's myriad contributions to the literature of the field include editorships of geographical analysis in the methods section of the annals. He served on many boards of our leading journals. Mike, in conjunction with colleagues, edited and published what is known as the Big Book in GIS, uh, Geographical Information Systems, Principles, Techniques, Applications, and Management, which became our Bible, our dictionary for many years. Another seminal volume that has become a standard textbook is his Geographic Information Systems and in Science published by Wiley in 2005. He has dozens of books and hundreds of papers on all aspects of our discipline. He's received many honors, including the 1990 Award for Scholarly Distinction, Canadian Association of Geographers, the Horwood Critique Prize from ERISA, the AAG Award for Distinguished Scholarship, uh, Educator of the Year from the Uni University Consortium for GI Science, the Founders Medal, the Royal Geographical Society, the Lifetime Achievement Award from ESRI, and he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Those are just a few of his many contributions and achievements. He's also finally received a number of multiple honorary doctoral degrees including one from his alma mater McMaster University. So uh, please join me in welcoming the 2008 John Borcher lecture speaker Dr. Michael Goodchild who will talk to us today on geographic information in the world of web 2.0. Mike. Um, thank you, Bob, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you for coming this afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to do this. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and to be asked to give the Borchett Lecture, and it brings back very fond memories of John when he was on the Board of Directors of NCGIA back in the early 1990s. Um, what I'd like to uh, talk about today is a topic that I find very interesting and exciting, and particularly for um, the world of geographic information and for its interaction with society as a whole. Um, typically in the past, I think we tend to have seen GIS as a professional specialty. We tend to have trained a cadre of professionals to do GIS. And in recent years with systems such as Google Earth, we've seen a substantial democratization of this field. And in essence, I think the, ch the questions have changed. Um, the questions are now much more about how the general public is engaged in this enterprise and much less about how how it's an, a specialty which is limited just to a few. So that's kind of the framework, but I think an interesting place to start is with this question, because I want to talk about the supply of geographic information much more than the uh, consumption of geographic information. How is geographic information created? And typically we tend to think of this in terms of authorities and their experts. So we think of the US Geological Survey as the primary national civilian mapping agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency as the military equivalent. Uh, every country has some kind of national mapping agency. It's in a surprising number of countries, it is a military operation. I think it's still true to say that in South America, the only country with a civilian mapping agency is Colombia and all the others are still military. Um, it's increasingly a function of state and local governments, and of course this metropolitan area has been one of the leaders in developing local government-based um, geographic information production. It's then disseminated and, and to users who are largely assumed to be non-expert. So this is definitely a contrast between experts as producers and non-experts as consumers. And that dissemination, of course, often occurs with restrictions. Uh, restrictions in the interests of national security, particularly after, even in this country, after 9-11, there were significant questions about national security. Um, there are many, many variations around the world in how this is financed, uh, whether distribution is at the cost of reproduction or whether some part of the production costs get recovered by charging for geographic information. 
That's a sharp contrast there between U.S. federal policy and policies in the rest of the world. That's, that's the prevailing model. But let me focus particularly on one type of geographic information. And I want to talk about the gazetteer, the names layer, the layer of information which provides place names on the Earth's surface. Because in this country, like many others, there is a formal naming process. And at the top of it sits the US Board on Geographic Names, which was founded in 1890 and founded largely for the purpose of standardizing the use of geographic names. And underneath it is a hierarchy of boards from local to national, almost entirely composed of experts. Um, no real role here for the amateur, for the general public. This is a professional, authoritative naming system. And it's driven, as I say, by a need to standardize, to avoid confusion, by issues of, of standardization in the interests of postal delivery. So duplicate names of towns were removed largely in the 19th century when, when postal delivery took off. Compare that to this, which takes us back 500 years to 1507 and to a small town in Lorraine in France called saint dié de vosges where two people, Martin Waldseemuller and Vautrin Lud, were driven to create a new map of the world. And they had no authority whatever. Um, they were amateurs in every sense of the word. And they drew a map based on recent discoveries by the Portuguese and the Italians and the Spanish. And to the west of the Atlantic, there was this large blob of land, and they needed to put some label on it. And they were convinced as a result of letters they'd recently received from Florence that the, person, the first person to recognize the New World as a continent, or as we would say now, two continents, was Amerigo Vespucci from Florence. And so they decided to name this continent, pair of continents, America. They took his first name, which is unusual. They feminized it because they believed that every continent should have a female name. And they put the word America on the map. And that was the act which named America. There was absolutely no formality, absolutely no authority. Here were two amateurs sticking a name on a map. And it was simply because that map was then distributed around Europe and the name caught on that we call the country we live in the United States of America, not the United States of Colombia or the United States of something else. That is essentially an amateur process. No authority, no officialdom. Um, it is interesting that later uh, Martin Veltzimuller regretted this, um, became convinced that uh, Vespucci was a bit of a charlatan, that he hadn't really done some of the things he claimed, and in a subsequent edition of the map actually removed the name. But the name stuck, and we are today in the United States of America. So that provides me with, I think, an interesting parallel to what I want to talk about, which is in many ways what is happening today in the world of geographic information. And I prefer to talk under the heading of volunteer geographic information, or VGI, because I want to emphasize the aspect of volunteering. That is, this is citizens volunteering information. But there are many, many other terms and many other relevant terms. Um, it's a, certainly a phenomenon of the 21st century. Nobody would have talked this way um, in the past. And it's almost a phenomenon of recent months. Many of these sites that I'll show you are very, very recent. Um, a, a related term is user-generated content, or UGC. This is the users of the web generating the content of the web. This is not the web as a top-down method of dissemination of authority. It's a method by which the users of the web take over and generate the content. Um, term collective intelligence, which implies that if enough people put their minds to the same thing, the result will converge on the truth. Very interesting concept, which is very deeply embedded in, in all of this. Um, crowdsourcing essentially means the same thing, um, that if you want to get at the truth, if you have enough people telling you what the answer is, the answer will converge on the truth. Um, this is asserted information in the sense that it is asserted by individuals who have no authority. So I want to contrast asserted information on the one hand with authoritative information on the other. And essentially what it amounts to is the empowerment of millions of private citizens, largely untrained, no obvious reward, no guarantee that what they do is true, and no authority to do so. 
And that's, that's the setup. That's the, the world I want to talk about because I think it's an interesting world. So before we go any further, um, let's look at a couple of examples. And it's fun to do that live rather than um, in terms of screenshots. So here we are on one site, which is Wikimapia, wikimapia.org. Uh, when you bring it up, it's interesting that these days this is one of the sites that tells you where you are. Um, there's a little cross here right on Minneapolis. Uh, it knows where I am because of my IP address. Um, and increasing number of sites, of course, do that. It, it's exciting to me that finally my computer knows where it is. It's known, what, it's known what time it is for a long time, but finally it knows where it is. So we'll go to Southern California, to Santa Barbara, and we'll zoom down. You can see this is a Google Maps interface. And we'll go to the campus of UCSB. And uh, probably down to about there. Oh, a few more. And you'll see a whole lot of rectangles coming up on the screen. And these rectangles, all of them, mark some feature on the Earth's surface that somebody has thought to be interesting and has provided associated information. So if I go to, for example, this one, Ellison Hall. Happens to be the office building that I work in. And if I click on it, I get whatever description somebody thought was interesting for that building, uh, where the geography lab is located. OK. Um, and every one of these rectangles is similar. And if you look up over here, you will see that worldwide, there are now 8.8 uh, 8 .8 million rectangles. So 8.8 .8 million features on the Earth's surface that somebody has found interesting and been motivated to, to enter. And of course, you could do this yourselves. You could go home tonight, and you could uh, enter the, some location of interest, some location that you find interesting. Um, some of these are quite humorous. If you click on Isla Vista, we've now gone just to the west of the campus. If you know UCSB, the Isla Vista is where most of our students live, and the description is, is quite colorful. Quintessential college town, students attending, living, party as hard as they study, and on the weekends, binge drinking and promiscuous sex occur on a grand scale. <laughs> far more interesting than the, the typical entry in a gazetteer, <laughs> which will give you the official name, perhaps a point location, perhaps a type, and that's it. If we go a little bit further west, you will see there's a, should be, a very small rectangle here, <laughs> which is my house. And if you click on it, you will see it's where I live with Fiona. Um, I, I entered this a couple of years ago um, to impress one of my classes. And by the time I got to the class and opened this up, it had disappeared. Because Wikipedia, uh, Wikimapia, like Wikipedia, has some uh, gatekeeper function. And my house was considered to be of not of sufficient significance to be described in Wikimapia. So I then went back and put it in again with a link to my Wikipedia site. And I guess that's enough. So if you have a Wikipedia page, you're OK. <laughs> So this is, this is one example, right? What's happening here is millions of private citizens motivated to do this. No reward, whatever. Why are they doing it? An interesting question. Who is doing it? And what kinds of uh, coverage does this achieve of the world? What kinds of information are people motivated to create? And what it's really doing then is, is bringing the process of geographic information creation down to the level of the average citizen, which is what I find to be particularly interesting. Right, we'll go back to uh, PowerPoint. And uh, just to illustrate that this is a worldwide phenomenon, here is Medina in uh, Saudi Arabia. And every one of these rectangles is a feature that someone has felt to be of interest. Uh, many of them are religious sites in Islam. And many of them have descriptions in Arabic with links to other Arabic information. And uh, here is uh, Flickr, which you may be familiar with. Uh, Flickr now has well in excess of a billion photographs, all of them georeferenced to the Earth's surface. So if you go, for example, as I have here, to Uluru in Central Australia, you will find, when I did this, there were 3,000 photographs in Flickr of Uluru. And we have technology now that will take all of those photographs, composite them to build up a three-dimensional model of the feature. Um, this is an interesting description which was entered by this person. There's a link here to the person who entered it, and there's a link to other information. Um, very interesting application of this that I came across. Um, David Craig, who's a biologist at, uh, I'm sorry, um, not David Craig. Um, David, uh, yes, David Craig, um, who's a biologist at uh, Willamette University in Oregon. 
who has gone through, he, he specializes in the tern, which is a difficult bird to track because the bird is fairly small and its migration paths are very long. Um, the Arctic tern migrates from one pole to the other pole every year. And the bird is simply not big enough to carry a GPS tracking device. Um, so what he's done is gone through the Flickr um, database, searched for all mentions of the word tern in the description, found roughly 130 photographs, and contacted the, pers the people who posted them, and now has a network of amateur observers that help him in his research. And it's a worldwide network. So there's some creative applications that I think people are, people are coming up with. Here's Flickr in the case of uh, Santa Barbara. This is the mission, and there's several hundred photographs of the, mi of the mission in Flickr. But I want to fo uh, focus on this one entry here, uh, which is in the middle of Mission Park. And if you know Santa Barbara, this is a beautiful green park. But somebody has entered a picture of Joe's Cafe in that park. Clearly, Joe's Cafe is not in the park. Was this an honest mistake? Was it deliberate um, mischief? We don't know. But I think the point I want to make here is that a geographic mistake like this is particularly glaring because we know there should not be a, a, a cafe in the middle of the park, at least not in the North American context. And so it would be very easy for Flickr's software to detect this as a potential error, flag it, perhaps delete it, perhaps query it, so that error checking is actually much easier in the case of things, sites like this than it would be, for example, in Wikipedia. Geographic facts are always interrelated. Geography always provides context. And so that provides a very simple basis for error checking in systems like this. Um, here is OpenStreetMap, which is um, in many ways one of the more interesting of these uh, sites, and there are many hundreds of them. Uh, OpenStreetMap is an effort to create a free digital open source map of the world led by a geography graduate student and the University College London and it works by recruiting amateurs who will go out on their bicycles or walking with a GPS tracking their route writing down the street names and then uploading them to the database and here for example is the coverage of central London every bit as good as any map you will buy of central London but created by many amateurs and created free. There is no cost to anybody of this, apart from the purchase of the GPS receiver. The cartography, interestingly, and this is a very nice cartographic rendering, the cartography is in the software. Now I'll come back to this later because the cartographic expertise needed to make a map no longer requires a cartographer in the flesh in systems like this. The cartography is embedded in the software. Uh, OpenStreetMap is interesting because its coverage is, of course, uneven. So analyzing what parts of the world have been mapped and what parts haven't, I think, is an interesting um, research project. This is Dublin. And if you lived in Dublin and were so motivated, you might well spend this evening cycling around the streets in this area here, filling in the hole in the map. An excellent thing to do. And you could imagine you were a 21st century Columbus. Um, exploring an, an unknown part of the world. OpenStreetMap also raises an interesting question, which is that having created this, we now have an asset of significant value. Because what OpenStreetMap is competing with is Navtech and Teleatlas, the makers of street centerline databases. And here is something all of a sudden which is free. So how that works out, how that plays out when you create through volunteer effort a product which has substantial commercial value is a very interesting question. It's a question which many people are asking of Google. When you use Google services for innocent personal uh, tasks, the results stay with Google and they, in certain conditions, acquire commercial value. They also acquire um, ethical value in terms of uh, surveillance and, and privacy invasion. These are many of the questions that I think arise in, in, this, in this context. Uh, I think while we're talking about uh, volunteer geographic information, we should talk about Google mashups. So here is Google Earth. And here is just a quick example of a mashup um, that somebody has provided. A volunteer has provided the two and a half dimensional extrusions of the buildings in downtown Vancouver in this case. 
And across the web, there are hundreds of thousands of such mashups, representing a, a very substantial volunteer investment by a very large community. Um, here is uh, Katrina. And it's worth making a point here, I think, of the value of this kind of work in emergency response. Because in the case of Katrina, it was possible for people to provide mashups, in this case, the three dimensional structures of the buildings in downtown uh, New Orleans, including the Superdome, and to take photographs on the ground and link them, make them accessible through Google Earth. So amateurs with video cameras or simple cameras were able to provide very valuable information about damage um, through this medium of Google Earth. The paradox, the irony to me, is that while all of us could see this almost in real time as the relief effort developed, the people who needed this information could not because they were in the donut hole the area created by the impact of Katrina where there was no power, no computers, no internet connections. So in effect, this is a vicarious way of viewing a disaster that is not in fact available to the people who most need it. And that, that's a real issue for uh, emergency management in general, I think. Um, here's one I did myself, and it's almost, again, it's fun to do this um, live. So here's um, uh, Google Earth. And we'll go from the Canadian Rockies to an area of central London. And instead of the standard Google Earth base, this is a historic map provided by the David Rumsey collection in San Francisco. This is a map of London in 1843. Uh, the subject here is the cholera outbreak in the Soho area in 1854, uh, which was studied by John Snow, who made a map of the outbreak. And so as a mashup, I've created a layer of the... Um, I thought I had. <laughs> there we go. Of the many hundreds of deaths that occurred in cholera outbreak, and then um, I can also add the thing that um, John Snow found most compelling, which was the locations of the. Yeah, come on, there you go. The locations of the pumps, uh, the various water supply um, sources, because if you know this story, and it's beautifully told in a recent book called A Ghost Map, um, what Snow was interested in was identifying the, the causal mechanism for the transfer of cholera. And he recognized that all of these deaths were closely packed around this one pump in Broad Street and was able, therefore, to argue that it was the water from the pump that was causing the cholera outbreak. A wonderful story in public health, but nice these days to, to uh, work up as a, as a mashup in Google Earth, um, exploiting this kind of technology. Um, let me step back then from this and talk somewhat about some of the concepts involved and some of the technologies. And, and perhaps the first concept that I think is particularly relevant is the concept of national spatial data infrastructure. Essentially, I think what's been happening over the past two decades, and perhaps longer, is that the traditional authoritative process for production of geographic information has been breaking down. Government is increasingly reluctant to fund the making of maps. This is a worldwide phenomenon and to increasingly reluctant in the face of increasing demand. Geographic technologies make it possible for people to do things with maps and have been driving up the demand for digital geographic data at a time when government's increasingly reluctant to, to fund the production. And at the same time, smaller agencies, individuals, have been empowered to create maps because the cost of entry into the mapping business has fallen essentially to zero. 30 years ago, to be a map maker, you needed an investment perhaps of half a million dollars in the necessary analytical stereo plotters and drafting tables. Today, all you need is a laptop with, with suitable software. Data sources have been proliferating, and as a result, what used to be a top-down flow of geographic information has been reversing to a bottom-up flow. And many, many examples of ways in which individuals, small agencies, are producers now of geographic information, whereas they used to be exclusively consumers. 
1992 National Academy report talked about the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, in fact coined the term, and envisioned an increasingly patchwork approach, where central government would no longer be the only source, sources would proliferate, and what had been a centrip centrifugal flow became essentially a network flow. Uh, President Clinton signed an executive order in 1994 initiating the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. Standards have been developed. The Federal Geographic Data Committee has been empowered, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this, I think, fits within a trend which was already apparent by the early 1990s, a trend towards the breakdown of the traditional authoritative system. 